Hello and a very good evening to you and welcome to Cross Current. A happy 2015 to you. And this year too, like last year, in the program that features the most current and hot topics, we are promising you the best. And what more is more current than the presidential elections 2015? And without much ado on my introduction, let me go straight to introduce my guest today. we got a very prominent guest on our first show of 2015. That is none other than Dr. Dan Jayatilaka. Dr. Dan Jayatilaka is Sri Lanka's former ambassador and permanent representative to UN in Geneva. And subsequently, he was the Sri Lankan ambassador to France, UNESCO, and is author of several books on uh, the international uh, arena uh, published in Britain and US. Dr. Jayatilaka, thank you very much for taking time off and joining CrossCurrent today. Thank you for having me here. I'm <laughs> happy to be here. Yeah. How is 2015 treating you? Good. Well, it's very interesting. We couldn't have got off to a more interesting Better start. start yeah. yes. it's, not, it's not going to be a boring year. <laughs> yes, right. Um, like I said, there's nothing more current uh, in people's minds and in their lips and their hearts than the 2015 uh, presidential elections. Tell me, to start, what is the present political climate? How do you see it in Sri Lanka? Well, uh, it's a very competitive political system. I'm, I'm happy about that because mm. for too long, I have been dismayed and even disgusted at the idea that what we had was some kind of dictatorship. Mm -hmm. uh, even the Tamil National Alliance in its official statement pledging support to the opposition candidate talks about an inexorable uh, trend to dictatorship and totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. Now if it's inexorable, I don't see how they are hoping to stop it, but the fact that you have a keenly fought presidential election. Uh, the outcome of which is uncertain, as it should be, uh, tells me that it's all nonsense. I mean, you can't have a dictatorship, still less an inexorable drift to one, and to totalitarianism, no less, uh, in which you really don't know what the outcome of the presidential election is. And the opposition, at one at the same time, they say that Mahindra Rajapaksa is going to lose in a few days, and that he's a, a, a dictator. And I don't, I don't know of any dictator who you can get rid of yeah, and through a peaceful uh, election. Be, exactly. <laughs> My recollection of any dictator is a person who has come through a military regime or who has overthrown. The, we are talking of a person who has been elected. Well, but Is it uh, correct even to person to think like that? Uh, well, no, Chanaka. I mean, look, uh, Adolf Hitler was elected in 1933. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are instances of people who were elected who later became dictators. Mm -hmm. But the problem... Uh, that many people have with Mahindra Rajapaksa is that he has had far too many elections. Mm. Now, I don't know of any dictator who has had so many elections uh, and uh, is about to have another one. So, uh, we are not, and we've never been a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. The only dictator that we ever had here was Mr. Velupile Prabhakaran. Mm. And it's ironic that the TNA that didn't have a single word to say against him then, uh, and who even regards him as quote-unquote a great hero now, uh, is supporting the opposition because they want to oppose the totalitarian dictatorship of Mahindra Rajapaksa. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a race. It's a good presidential race. The appearance of political monopoly, which is confused for dictatorship, was simply because the opposition didn't have a decent candidate. Right. It, it had Mr. Ronald Wickremesinghe. Yeah. Uh, and now they've got a candidate uh, who is electable. So it's uh, a race. And... Sri Lanka can be seen uh, for what it always was, a vibrant, competitive electoral democracy. I'm very happy about that. Right. Now, one of the things that uh, these uh, opposition parties uh, are putting forward is, it's a trump card, I would say, uh, a, a attempted trump card, that the ending of executive presidency in 100 days. What is your thoughts on this? Can this be done? What, what is your thoughts on this? And, and why do we need to end that? Chanaka, uh, as a, a political scientist, yes. I'm alarmed and I'm shocked mm. by this campaign pledge, which is really the, the pivot of the yeah. whole... The heart of the campaign pledge. The heart of the campaign, because it's on page 14 of the opposition's manifesto. Yeah. Uh, that's chapter one. Yeah. And it's in a box and it's in bold type. It says the abolition of the executive presidency. Now, uh, let me tell you why I'm alarmed. Uh, I'm alarmed for more than one reason. If I were alarmed for only one reason, we could sort of dismiss that. Okay, there's just one point. 
I am alarmed for several reasons. In the first place, Chanaka, as you well know, uh, the most successful countries in the world uh, have executive presidential systems. Mm. If you take uh, the UN Security Council, four out of five mm. have executive presidencies. The United States, France, Russia and China, mm. with only Great Britain having uh, their own uh, parliamentary model. If you were to take the emerging or pivotal powers, the emerging world powers uh, gathered together in BRICS, the famous mm. BRICS. Well, there are again Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, only India has a parliamentary system. So, parliamentary systems are to be seen mainly in Great Britain and the former British colonies. Mm. Uh, the rest of the world, the most exciting, successful places, which are very different from each other. I mean, what does the United States and Cuba have in common? They both have executive presidential systems. What does Brazil have in common with uh, Indonesia? These are executive presidencies. Uh, so, when you have a system, thanks to Mr. Jawadana, Jaya Jawadana, that brings us out of this old-fashioned Westminster colonial model and puts us in the same category as uh, most of the world, then why would you want to abolish it? Now, I can understand the criticisms. Uh, the rational criticism is that, well, our executive presidency is not quite as accountable as the American presidency. Then that's fine. But then we, amend we cannot it. say that. We, we, we did make, after the 18th Amendment, we did make the president uh, answerable to an extent in the parliament. No, yeah. we didn't. I, I don't think so, because we abolished the two-term limit. Yes. Now, the Americans have a two-term limit. Yes. The 18th Amendment abolished the yes. two-term limit. Now, again, if you take the abolition of the two-term limit, yeah. there are other places which have done so, and they aren't ruled by the Rajapaksas. Yes. Uh, Evo Morales yeah. of Bolivia was just re-elected for yeah. the third term yeah. through a constitutional amendment at an election. Yeah. Uh, Nicaragua has abolished term limits. Mm. Venezuela has abolished term limits. Algeria has abolished term limits. Mm. Uh, and in any case, very powerful prime ministerships such as that of Great Britain, which is a nuclear power, mm. uh, has no term limits. Maggie Thatcher was in her fourth term mm. uh, when there was this cabinet revolt. Mm. So, um, if the problem is that our presidential system has surplus power, yes. then the solution is to bring it in line or bring it back in line with other executive presidential systems. Right. Now, as you know, Chanaka, ours is not modeled so much on the US presidential system, but was known from the 1970s to have been modeled on the French, French system. system. Okay. So, uh, at that time, Professor A.J. Wilson, the doyen of uh, Sri Lankan political scientists, uh, called it the Gaullist uh, Gaullist Bonapartist mm. or the Gaullist presidential system in Asia after uh, the republic, the presidential system that General de Gaulle mm. adopted in France. But if you have a problem with uh, the 18th Amendment, and I think there is a problem with the 18th Amendment, the solution is surely to reintroduce the 17th Amendment in the same way it was done originally mm. through parliament, mm. through a parliamentary majority, mm. not to abolish the executive presidential system which most of the countries in the world actually have and for a reason. Why does the United States have an executive presidential system? Through the deliberation of the founding fathers. Why does France years, yes. have one? Uh, you know, why do Russia and China have these? That's because it is a better system. Now, why should we abolish in a hundred days a much better system mm. and bring back this old colonial British parliamentary system, which was very bad for us. Now, Lee Kuan Yew, in his two-volume autobiography, uh, Singapore from Third World to First World, talks about Sri Lanka. Now, of course, he's talked about Sri Lanka before, but this is in his autobiography. He says that in the first 10 years after independence, we were uh, really the wonder of Asia. 
uh, we were way ahead and uh, he was amazed when he came here in the early 50s. But he says Sri Lanka then became a, a negative example, a story that should not be repeated. And that happened because of the passions of the parliamentary system, ethnic, religious, uh, ideological. Uh, the passions and volatility of the parliamentary system which caused Sri Lanka to move away from its successful course and then it went downhill. Now, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's own uh, solution to that in Singapore was not to abolish the, the parliamentary system, but it was to uh, jail the main opposition leader. Mm. Uh, Mr. Jairatnam, if I remember right, mm. for a large number of years. Not jail, he put him in a children's park mm. uh, for decades. Mm. And then he shut down the trade unions. Mm. Now, uh, I wouldn't recommend that for Sri Lanka. And certainly, Mr. Jaya Jawadana, mm. who agreed with Lee Kuan Yew, that it is the volatility of parliamentary politics uh, in an ethnically and ideologically divided uh, island state that caused our, our decline. Uh, he proposed a different solution as far back as 1966. He proposed what he called a strong and stable executive free from the whims and fancies of the legislature. Right. Now, that is what we have in place. So, I am shocked that we want to break this, shatter this uh, and go back to uh, an unsuccessful British colonial parliamentary model. Right. Uh, the second reason that I'm appalled, uh, or is it the third, I've lost count now, no is that the opposition seeks to do this in a hundred days. Yes. I mean, I Such know of hurry. no country yeah. in which so fundamental a political change, this is an upending of the entire political system, because what is our political system, what is our constitution? It's known as a president, it's a conversion from the Westminster model to the presidential system. That's what happened in 1978. So that is the fundamental characteristic of Sri Lanka's democratic political system of the form of state we have. Now, the opposition is proposing to just upend that in a hundred days and replace it with a parliamentary system. Now, right. look, that's a recipe for chaos, for yeah. anarchy. You don't do that. That's not the way to change a constitution. Right. And now, taking the separation of powers, like you correctly said, Separation powers, as you know, has to have the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary separate. This is the whole idea. If you take out the executive presidency and put it, bring back the old parliamentary system, and as you would know as, 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 as persons who have written and studied this, that the separation power does not uh, properly work out there. And, and, and recently in, in the United Kingdom, uh, the, the House of Lords, the power of judiciary was taken out of House of Lords, and they put the Supreme Court for to bring back this. So... Hasn't J President Jayawadana, didn't he realize after several, nearly about 30, 40 years of the prime ministership, it is not working? That is why he brought the executive oh, presidency. And also, uh, uh, my, my pivotal question is this. Do you think we could have ever ended the war we ended if we did not have one man making decisions as a president? Leave aside Sri Lanka. Do you think even US could have ever successfully done any of those wars or, or bringing peace or whatever they are doing if they didn't have executive presidency? Well, Chanaka, this is a fundamental issue of uh, political philosophy, yeah. of how you organize a human enterprise. Mm. Now, we are expecting His Holiness the Pope, yes. Pope Francis, mm. in uh, January. Mm. Um, the Pope leads the Catholic Church, which has one billion members. Uh, the Christian community as a whole has two billion, but the other billion, the non-Catholics, are divided into uh, rather smaller churches, the main Anglican church and the Methodists and the Baptists and so on and so on and so forth. Now, they all believe in the same God and, in, and they're based on the Bible, especially the New Testament. So what makes the Catholic Church so successful? It is the oldest organization in the world in the world. Mm. The fact that it has a leader, yeah. the Pope, yes. His Holiness the Pope. One leader. Now, uh, without that leader, mm. to whom Catholics all over the world look up to, yeah. there is no unifying symbol. 
and uh, then the Catholic Church would have been like all the other uh, non-Catholic Christian churches which are well much smaller and haven't lasted as long uh, and are not as successful. So this is the principle of leadership and what we have in Sri Lanka is a democratic form of centralization. Mm -hmm. Somebody who stands above, uh, elected by our vote, the island is taken as one unit and 50.1 percent have to vote for the leader. Now surely that is a much better system than having uh, a parliamentary and cabinet government where somebody who represents only his or her own electorate, yes. say Colombo, and happens to be the head of their political party because the party has an undemocratic constitution, uh, then becomes the prime minister. I mean, how can such a person uh, be a real unifying symbol? Mm. So I would say that the principle of having uh, an identifiable and visible leader, as in the case of uh, uh, His Holiness the Pope, mm. is the best evidence that human enterprise requires leadership. Mm. Somebody who can make the decisions because they have the, the power to do so, uh, drawn from, from below. So I think that it's a much better system. Now, you asked me about the presidential system in Sri Lanka. It's not just the war, Shanaka, I'll come to the war. Mm. But President Mr. Jawadhan was very correct when he established this executive presidency because he knew that he could not sustain the economic revolution of the open economy without a stable executive. He had been the finance minister in 1952 mm. and he tried to implement certain measures. I'm not saying they were right, but there was a hartal, that is a massive popular uprising. Uh, so he was not able to do that. He realized that and he did not want to, uh, you know, lock up opposition leaders, uh, though he did disenfranchise Mr. Banaraka. Mm. Instead, he thought of a systemic solution mm. and that is that there would be the strong and stable executive free, as he said, from the whims and fancies of the parliament. And that is why we were able to have an open economy 10 years before India. More, yeah. more. In fact, the Much Indian more. economy yeah. was opened up in 1991. Yeah. Uh, ours was opened up in the latter 70. part of the 1970s. Yes. So we were able to do that because President Jawadhan had very consciously uh, changed the political architecture and had this uh, presidential system. Now, another president, his successor, Mr. Jawadana's successor, President Ranasinghe Premadasa, uh, defended the executive presidency during the impeachment. And I, the impeachment reminds me of what's going on now. Uh, and I remember Mr. Uh, Premadasa saying uh, to me, but he, he sort of pretty much said this uh, in public as well. He said, if not for this executive presidential system, I would not be able to deliver the goods and services that I am now doing to, for the people, the housing program, the Jana Savia, uh, and so many other uh, projects, the free school uniforms. These are all executive decisions. And he told me that if not for uh, what Mr. Jawadhan, he's called Mr. Jawadhan, uh, set up the executive presidency. I would have no instrument exactly. with which to deliver this to the people. He said, do you think this cabinet would have let me do so? <laughs> he said, when I was prime minister, they cut my funds for housing. They cut my funds and I had to start a seven uh, uh, lottery, lottery to raise funds. To raise funds. Yes. So that's what President Premadasa felt about the executive presidency as an instrument. Now we come to your question about the war. Chanaka, can you imagine if these command decisions about war and peace had to be made by reference to the cabinet, decided upon in cabinet and in a coalition government? I mean, it's impossible, it's unthinkable that we would have won the war in three and a half years. Yes. And that is because the right man was in the right place. I mean, if the right man had been in parliament and cabinet, it wouldn't have worked is because he was in the right place, the executive presidency. Of course, if you are the wrong man, and we did have four earlier presidents who didn't have the resolve to do the job, but 
uh, Mr. Rajapaksa had the instrument, the executive presidency and the resolve. It's much easier, Chanaka, mathematically, for any nation to find one outstanding leader sometime. It may take 10 years, 5 years, 20 years. It's very difficult to find 250 <laughs> responsible and outstanding leaders, which is what you need in a parliamentary government. Yeah. That brings me to the next very, very question. Now, supposing if this were to done, be able to happen, executive presidency somewhere down the line is uh, abolished, parliamentary system comes in and there's a uh, PM or prime minister. Now, this PM, like you mentioned, it's a guy who's elected from one constituency where few amount of people likes. So he becomes a head. Correct me if I'm wrong correct, in my analogy. Correct, absolutely he correct. becomes a head. Yeah, yeah. And then he or she, yeah. he or she <laughs> could become the head. <laughs> and then what happens is he makes decisions. Yep. And there are now he will make decisions which are in the nature of executive as well, because there is nobody yes, else to course, make the uh, decisions. PM, yeah. And these are not the decisions that the rest of the country wants. Of course. And, and he doesn't feel responsible, he doesn't feel the pressure from the country as a whole. Yeah, and the flip side of this story is m other people, other, other 200 uh, odd uh, MPs or whoever who will be pressured from the people who are, uh, who are representing might tell, don't support this decision, support that decision. So, don't you think, if I may use the word anarchy in parliament could happen if a, a, a prime minister was to hold and execute the duties of executive. Well, Chanaka, uh, you are right, but it's... I don't even, know how far my analysis is correct. Even, uh, uh, yes. You're right, yeah. but uh, it's even worse than It could that. be worse. Because, okay. I mean, let's talk Turkey as they say. Let's mm. talk, uh, talk in, in realistic terms. How would this work out? Uh, Mr. Sirisena, if he wins, would have been elected by uh, a majority of the votes 50.1. Yeah. In 100 days, and in fact, the... The diary of the future president, that's another document that's been distributed, right. uh, says that on April 20th, that the executive presidential system would be abolished and power handed to a parliamentary system of government. Mm. Right. So come April 20th, mm. you have a popularly elected man who has given away his powers. Right. Right. So you have one power center, uh, the person who has been elected and who people like. Mm. That's one but shrunken. Then you have the new prime minister, whoever that is. Well, in the first hundred days, it's going to be Ranil because it's been said so. Uh, after the first hundred days, there would be elections if the opposition wins and, uh, well, whoever leads the bigger party. Now, what strikes me is that Mr. Sirisena doesn't say, look, I'm going to be the prime minister because, you know, like President Jawadhan, he was first prime minister and then he implemented this new constitution and he moved up to become president, I'm going to move down. So, I come in as president, I abolish this uh, dreadful executive presidency, which most of the world has, but that's all right, in a hundred days. And then I am going to lead the Sri Lanka Freedom Party in the parliamentary election. And uh, I'm quite confident that we shall uh, prevail. And I shall be the new prime minister uh, endowed with executive powers through the cabinet because I have transferred power to the parliament. Mm. Now, Mr. Sirisena is conspicuously silent. He doesn't say that at all. Mm. Furthermore, furthermore, uh, on public occasions, uh, Mr. Vikramasinghe has gone on the record with Mr. Sirisena seated uh, demurely next to him, such as at the corporate forum, the business forum in Colombo, where uh, a question was sent up, what would happen to Mr. Sirisena a hundred days into his government after he has implemented these measures? And Mr. Sirisena didn't reply. The reply came from Ranil Wickremesinghe. And he said, uh, well, the executive powers would have been handed over. I would have been the prime minister in the first hundred days. Then we'll have elections. Uh, whoever forms, uh, who has the biggest party will be the next PM. The second largest will be the deputy PM. And um, uh, the president will take care of good governance, good governance. Oh. And then he goes on to say, and this will interest you because you're a lawyer, he says something that I've never heard of before. He says there will be four arms of government, oh. the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, and good governance. <laughs> I mean, 
China, we've heard of the three estates and the fourth estate being the press, the media. Yes. But uh, Rani uh, contributes to political science by placing good governance in a separate category, which means the executive doesn't have to engage in good governance, nor does the legislature, mm -hmm. right? And then he says, uh, there are NGOs and civil society, and the president will take care of that. So in other words, poor Mr. Sirisena, having got the votes that Ranil and Chandrika cannot get for themselves, would have uh, got state power, handed it to these two, who will then share it out among themselves. He would be like a scarecrow in a paddy field. Uh, he would be powerless, he'd be taking care of good governance. Uh, Mr. Vikramasinghe doesn't even say he's going to be the Minister of Defence for six years. No. Uh, good governance and the NGOs and civil society. So you will have Mr. Sirisena, uh, look ma, I've shrunk the presidency, you know. And then there will be the PM and the Deputy PM, that would be Ranil, maybe Deputy PM if he doesn't, if his party doesn't come first. And who else would it be if the Sri Lanka, if President Rajapaksa has somehow lost uh, who will the SLFP cross over to? Not Mr. Sirisena, because Mr. Sirisena is going to be uh, the powerless president. They will get across to uh, Chandrika. I mean, you can already see it on your television screens. Who do the defectors defect to? Who, uh, even if their intentions were very understandable and audible, such as young uh, Hirunika Premachandra, uh, or uh, a little perhaps... Uh, more questionable like Rishad Badudin and so on and so forth. Who do they go across to? Who presides over the press conferences? Chandrika, not Maitripala. So, you will then have three plus power centers. Maitri as the popular but shrunken president, Ranil and Chandrika who will start squabbling with each other the moment, you know, they've actually got in there mm -hmm. as two competing power centers because now the power would have been transferred down to the cabinet. And not to mention these are two differing political parties. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have a tripolar power struggle lining up and I said plus. Mm. Then you have the provincial councils. Yes. Now I'm not saying that the morning after the Northern Provincial Council is going to uh, sort of hoist the Elam flag, mm. Chanaka. No. But in the absence of the executive presidential system, which is the large regulatory framework, uh, may I even say cage, mm. in which the Northern Provincial Council is constrained, in the absence of that constraint, there cannot but be a greater sense of self assertiveness mm. uh, because it will be a grey area. Mm. Constitutionally, where does the power of the governor come from? There's no executive president anymore. So you will have these units asserting themselves much more than they do now because there is a vacuum, a constitutional vacuum, a grey area, especially the Northern Council, which abuts, except for, you know, this narrow strip of water, 70 million uh, co-ethnics who are hostile to one of historically being hostile to uh, Sri Lanka. So, you therefore have three plus the provincial councils as power centers, multiple power centers, rather like the ancient Sri Lanka where uh, Prince Gamanu had to overcome, I think, 11 other kings in order to be able to rescue the country. Uh, you will have a number of these chieftains, the chief ministers and the provincial councils, plus these three, the shrunken presidency, uh, the newly empowered prime ministership, and the newly created deputy prime ministership. It is a recipe for chaos. It's a recipe for gridlock. We will not have the economic progress that we see. None of these projects will be finished because they will be pushing and pulling in various directions. Eternally they will be doing that. Uh, I mean, you, you will that. have a situation far worse than uh, President Jawadana's worst nightmares, which made him abandon yes. the parliamentary system and convert right. to an executive presidency. It's, it's, it's something that I completely deplore and advise against. Okay. There is school of thought about this opposing uh, candidates, um, different, so many candidates are there, but some of the candidates, uh, their manifestos, 
uh, has a tone of semblance of bringing back separatism. Is this true? Have you felt this? Or what's your taking on this? Well, I don't think it's intentional, Shanaka, but I look at it from a logical point of view. You know, when the 13th Amendment was brought in in 1987, two important things happened. Mm. Now, I know because I was a minister right. uh, under the 13th Amendment, mm. uh, I was, of course, much younger then, mm. in uh, the first Northeastern Provincial Council. Mm. So I was very intimately aware of what was going on. Now, in 87, the two things that have happened are very significant even today. Mm. The Supreme Court of Sri Lanka narrowly passed the 13th Amendment. I think it was by one vote, five to four or something. Yeah. And the judgment, which had nothing to do with the present uh, post-impeachment Supreme Court, mm. the judgment of that Supreme Court, which was a very robust one, was that the 13th Amendment remained within the framework of the unitary state because of just one factor alone. And that is the executive presidential system. Because the executive presidency represented the sovereignty of the people taken as a whole because the island as a whole votes for the executive president. And the sovereignty of the people as a whole supersedes the powers of the unit. The executive presidency hovers over the units and exercises its power and authority through the office of the governor. And the Supreme Court of that time said, that is the only guarantee. That's what prevents this provincial council system from punching through from being on the other side of the parameters, the borderline of the unitary state. Now, Chanaka, uh, as a lawyer, you would understand, of course, that there are countries which are not unitary states, Correct. which are federal. Right. I mean, you know, fine. But from 1972, uh, Mr. Colbinard de Silva uh, made it very clear, and it was followed by President Jawadhan, that a small island like this, which is next door, frankly, to Tamil Nadu, and has had a history of uh, osmosis between our north and their south, mm. needs to have a strong central unitary system. It cannot afford a federal system, right. which is uh, a collection of units. Mm. A unitary system devolves power, but is one system, and power is then shared from top. It kind of trickles down. That's a pro uh, provincial council system. So, when the Supreme Court says that it's only the executive presidency that keeps the provincial councils within the unitary state, then we have to decide what side of this argument we are on. Because once you remove that, you know, it's like removing the bird cage and being told, don't worry, the bird is not going to fly away. <laughs> No, I'm very sorry, yeah. but I simply cannot accept that guarantee. Mm. I, uh, I refuse to be a fool. Mm. Uh, now, I said two things happened in 87. Yeah. The second thing is what the TNA said. Mm. It wasn't the TNA, mm. it was the TULF mm. at that time. Now, even last year when the Provincial Council elections were held, the TNA reminded people that, well, even in 87, we didn't really accept the 13th Amendment. Because we pointed out, says the TNA, that there are limits on the powers of the Provincial Council because of the executive presidency. And, you know, they're quite honest. They said that. Mm. They said that in 1987. And they've continued to say that. Uh, Justice Vigneswaran, in his first official speech as the Chief Minister, of the new provincial council said this in his speech the 13th amendment is too limited is limited by the executive presidency and therefore the powers of the governor now even in their statement which announces support for uh, the opposition's common candidate uh, the tna says that the main reason is that the common candidate has pledged the abolition of the executive presidency so you know here is a party 
that is dedicated to the cause of going beyond the 13th Amendment and the unitary framework. The TNA has never sworn allegiance to the unitary framework of Sri Lanka. It has stood for a united Sri Lanka pretty much except for when it was uh, under the gun of the Tigers. But there is a difference between a unitary framework uh, and a federal uh, framework. Uh, you can have a united Sri Lanka which is federal um, or even confederal as you know. So, the TNA has always been against the executive presidency and when the executive presidency is removed, when that framework goes, then you are already beyond the unitary framework and this is what the TNA has said because the TNA says this is the lid that we have always been opposed to, the executive presidency. Now tell me, Chanaka, where will the power and authority of the governor come from? I mean, what is the ground as they say legally? What is the ground on which the governor will stand? What if Mr. Vigneshwaran files a case and says, excuse me, uh, now you no longer have the executive presidency <laughs> from which the authority of the governor flows yeah. and how dare you tell me what, what to, do. to do and what not to do. And uh, uh, I mean, I have no doubt that he will prove to be a much better lawyer. He is Sumandaran and Sam, uh, Mr. Sam Mandan than, uh, well, I don't know, uh, um, Mr. Champikaranavaka perhaps who guarantees that nothing of the sort will happen. Yeah. So, you know, I go by our Supreme Court and I also go by the TNA. So, if you lift this, this framework, the cage, the cage. Uh, is very clear what's going to happen. From day one, what is going to happen is you're going to have Chandrika's old package back. Do you remember the package, 1995 and 1997? Chandrika. You see the package that was never delivered. It was always a talking of Chandrika. Ch Chandrika kept <laughs> trying to implement something called a, pol a political package. Yeah. And this package in the two drafts of 95 and 97 uh, was for a redefinition of Sri Lanka as a union of regions. Right. So, in other words, we are not one together, no we, more unity. No, no, we are not one indissoluble caste iron, we are not uh, uh, one unit yes. uh, out of uh, you know solid steel, yes. which is a unitary state. No, yes. we would have been a collection like a, uh, a pearl necklace, which you can break, a collection of regions, a collection, a union of regions. In fact, when the executive presidency is abolished, if it is abolished, that's what will be, a collection of empowered provincial councils. Now, Chanaka, 30 years of war, something happened. It's not just that we beat the Tigers, thanks to Mahindra Rajapaksa, but we also have empowered provincial units. Mm. Now, you need the executive presidency to keep those within this framework. The other provinces are not going to be asking for a separate state, but they're going to be warlords I and mean, they're going to be doing their own thing, let alone the North. Now, why would we want to do this? Frankly, and here I'm not sounding too much like an ex-diplomat, mm. it sounds crazy to me. Yeah. It's just plain crazy. Right. Good government, governance, uh, a recent word. Uh, a year ago, we never heard about that. Nobody was making questions. Country is developing, we all can see that. S again, I had to bring the fact that some of these uh, manifestos, some of the opposition, uh, some of the people who are contesting are bringing this up. Define for me, Dr. Da uh, Dan Jayantilika, what is good governance and don't we have it at the moment? Well, I think we can do much better than we, uh, that, than we are doing. Yeah. I'm all for good governance and I'd like to see uh, quite a few improvements. Mm. I've been very critical of several things that have happened. But I also know where the problem is. Right. The problem is that the government has a two-thirds majority. I don't think it has one anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, it had for quite a long time a two-thirds majority. Now, if you take um, the, uh, the previous periods of our history, mm. uh, under, for instance, Prime Minister Sidibano Bharanayaka, there was far worse governance than there is now. Mm. I mean, you didn't have, you had only... Uh, you didn't have Rupavani, but that's okay. You had a state monopoly of the media. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether it was good governance that made people rummage in garbage cans and eat papaw skins under Madame Bananayak. Mm. 
Now that was under parliamentary system. The problem is that she had a two-thirds majority. Now, how is it that President Rajapaksa had a two-thirds majority? That's because people were running away from Mr. Anil Vikramasinghe. You have 43 MPs in the United National Party in opposition and 65 ex-UNP MPs in governance, in government, sorry. So, you not only have the executive presidency, you have this massive rubber stamp to, uh, of a two-thirds majority. Of course, President Rajapaksa welcomed these uh, defectors, but then so did President Kumaratunga. I mean, the first wave of uh, uh, refugees from Ranil's UNP was under Chandrika. I mean, there are some very prominent people who left under Chandrika. So, I think you need a government which doesn't have a two-thirds majority. Right now, you don't have one. And I think that at a parliamentary election, if we elect uh, Mr. Sirisena uh, as a strong opposition leader, or in fact, as prime minister, we can do that. Uh, I rather like him. I mean, I'd like to see him maybe be the leader of the country someday, but in the right way. First as leader of the opposition, PM, and then move up to the presidency. Then we shall have much better governance than we have had so far. I mean, we already have better governance because there's a competition, because it's not Ranil. I've always said anyone but Ranil, and now that's been proved. You have somebody who's not Ranil, yeah. and you have a presidential race, and uh, uh, things are much better because you don't have uh, the, the built-in two-thirds majority. So the problem was with the opposition. Ah. It is the weakness of the opposition that allowed bad governance. I mean, it's natural. Right. Uh, Chanaka, if you have a batsman who doesn't have to worry about fielders, mm. I mean, he'd just do whatever he wants. Yes. The problem is with the bowling side, yes. i.e. with the UNP. Yeah. Even now, I hope they've learned their lesson that uh, there's a surge for the opposition because it's not running, then it's my three. Mm. And if the UNP ever wants to, uh, to do well, it has to have somebody who uh, is more in line with the national sentiment, such as uh, Mr. Maithi Palasirisena. So, Let's take care of the problem of good governance mm. at the right place that we should do that. And that is at a parliamentary election. Mm. The presidential election is not about that, Chanaka. The presidential election, be it in the United States or France or Sri Lanka or the Philippines, is, a, is about choosing your leader, the leader of your nation, the leader of your country. And when you do that, mm. I think you have to look at Two criteria. One, how did this leader compare with his predecessors and with his challenger? Well, I mean, you have to look at the CV. Uh, I, I like Mr. Sirisena, but he has he, he does not have the outstanding record that Mahinda has, not only because he has been in office, but because Mahinda Rajapaksa did what four presidents failed to do, that is to defend us from terrorism. And that Successful eradication of terrorism is something that even the United States of America has been unable to do, the world's sole superpower exactly. in Afghanistan yes. and in Iraq. Yeah. And Mahinda did it in three and a half years. Right. Now, if it's attributed solely to General Fonseca, yeah. well, Chandrika had General Fonseca in the army for 10 years. Why didn't she make him the army commander and win the war? I mean, that's nonsense, yeah. stuff and nonsense. Yeah. So, uh, Mahinda did what many other leaders uh, and other much more powerful and richer countries have been unable to do. And he did it in three and a half years. And it's certainly something that his predecessors couldn't do. The next thing is he didn't uh, sort of turn around and sleep saying, I need a long rest mm. after that war. Uh, he has uh, maintained uh, or actually revived the economic growth rate. He has transformed this place, not only Colombo, but also uh, the provinces in terms of infrastructure. Uh, and our civilization is an infrastructural civilization. Our uh, what did our great leaders at the high points of our civilization do? Mm. They were builders. That's what we do. That's our path to glory. Mm. Building as a nation, right. not just as the kings. Yes. So that's what Mind has been doing. He's not been lazy. Uh, he's got a high growth rate. Even if you discount the government statistics and you go by the opposition statistics, mm. it's 6.8. That's what the opposition says. And that's a lot if you look around the Western economies, which are shrinking. Mm. So you have a successful leader. And you don't kick out a successful leader after two terms when you have given unsuccessful ones two terms as well, yes. such as Chandrika and uh, Jaya Jawadana. Yeah. You use the guy, like the Russians abused Putin for 15 years, mm. 
uh, like the Malaysians and the Singaporeans used uh, Bahatir and Lee Kuan Yew, you get the best out of him, you have the stability, you keep moving, and you do the course correction, because there has to be course correction, mm. at the parliamentary election, Chan, right. you don't throw the baby out with the bath bath. Right. Uh, there are other uh, certain, um, I think, opposing candidates and uh, opposing people uh, talks about an independent inquiry into the war. Now, you know we did our own inquiry, LLRC. People are happy about it. It talks of false as well as good. Tell me, what is this independent inquiry needed on the war? Is it needed? Is it just another trump card to win a certain amount of votes of a certain ethnic group? Or what is it taking on? Well, you know, Chanak, I would have been quite sympathetic had the opposition's manifesto said, we are opposed to the United Nations inquiry into so-called war crimes. We think it's hypocritical. We shall not cooperate with it. We shall not comply with it. But we shall implement to the letter the LLRC's recommendation of an independent inquiry into the incidents specified by the LLRC. Now, that's not what the opposition manifesto says. And that is also not what the annexure given at the press conference by the opposition uh, leader, uh, well, candidate says. What it says is, firstly, it doesn't criticize the international inquiry at all. Mm. Okay? Uh, now, in a manifesto that also does not mention non-alignment even once, uh, you know, I'm a little unhappy about mm. that. I'm a little suspicious. Mm. Then the annexure says that since we are not signatories to the Rome Statute, which set up the ICC, mm. I mean, Sri Lanka is not a signatory, yeah. uh, and we shall have a domestic inquiry. So, what does that mean? As Uday Gamanpil has pointed out, uh, it sounds like, you know, it would have been nice if we had been able to send these people to the ICC, mm. but we haven't signed the Rome Statute, so we are going to have a domestic inquiry instead. Yeah. But that's not the right, it doesn't sound right, Janaka. Now, of course, the government has also said they are going to have a domestic inquiry, but they have opposed in the manifesto as well, but also practically, the uh, UN inquiry. Now, that is the right way to go. I would have much preferred both sides to say, we are opposed to the international inquiry, but we shall implement the LLRC recommendations about uh, selective inquiry uh, into specific incidents. But I'm afraid the opposition's mention of the domestic inquiry, which is devoid of any criticism of the international inquiry, uh, is quite, quite uh, dismaying. Right. Now, we heard of, again, people shouting about war crimes. Uh, as, as war crimes, as I have heard, are against military people, military generals, military governments. Uh, we have not signed to any, any war crimes, uh, true. But my question to you is not all that. Um, in the recent past or recent history, you see um, Western governments make certain things as tools to control countries, regions, or, 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 or regimes. Human rights, freedom of media, war crimes are these things. Don't you see this sort of, uh, what shall I say, I can't really think of a word. This sort of thing coming from the winds of the West or people who want to control us in a way and, and, and it, is, it is because of this that these sort of allegations are made against us. Well, Chanaka, you know, I'm a former vice president of the UN Human Rights Council. Right. So I uh, really believe very firmly right. in uh, human rights and our international commitments. Right. It is precisely because I believe firmly in human rights and the exercise of human rights, that I regard this Western critique as utterly hypocritical because I have right. seen right. what has happened. I mean, Iraq, Libya, I mean, people are dying in their dozens every day because the West, in the name of human rights and good governance, broke these countries up and broke their states and kill their leaders or facilitate their lynching. Mm. And I look around the world. I, I belong to the Vietnam generation. I haven't forgotten Vietnam. 
And I visited Vietnam uh, at the invitation of President Rajapaksa in 2000, late 2009. And I actually saw the destruction for which there have been no reparations, no compensation. The U.S. courts have refused mm. to pay compensation for the victims of Agent Orange, which they dumped, mm. the chemical, mm. and which has caused children to grow up malformed. Mm. And fields still cannot be used. Mm. So I belong to the Vietnam generation. Mm. I know the hypocrisy of the West mm. when it comes to human rights. Mm. And therefore, as a champion of human rights, I'm opposed to that kind of hypocrisy. I'm also opposed to third world regimes which use the argument of sovereignty, mm. national sovereignty, to suppress their own people. Now, Where do we stand? As a country, yes. as a country, I think that we have the greatest guarantee of human rights, which is a competitive multi-party democracy. Mm. We have a way to go. We have to go much further in terms of the independence of the judiciary. Mm. But all of that can be done by good new laws. And where are laws made? In the parliament, in the legislature. Yeah. So let's do that in the legislature. If we like what the opposition says, and frankly, Chanaka, uh, the opposition manifesto has 11 chapters. I like chapters 2 to 11. I totally, totally oppose chapter 1, which is the most important chapter. I also like what I read in uh, President Rajapaksa's new manifesto, which I call MC3, mm. Mahinda Chintana 3. Mm. Uh, it's a very detailed developmental plan. I like that. Mm. But I also want more democracy, and I want better governance, and I want more reform. Mm. And I find that in the opposition manifesto. I want both. Mm. And I have a way, I have a formula by which we can get both. What's that? Which is, you re-elect President Rajapaksa, so you have the more experienced and successful captain of the ship. Right. Because I don't believe that the powers of captaincy should be shared among the sailors, which <laughs> exactly. is what uh, Maitri, yeah. Maitri's manifesto yeah. says will happen. with Every sailor the will be captain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. the parliament. Yeah. Uh, and I don't trust this first mate and second mate, Ranil and Chandrika, by the way. Right. I got to say this, I've been on that ship before. We've right. all been on that ship before yeah. in the 1990s. So I would say vote for uh, continuity. Mm. Uh, at, at the macro level with President Rajapaksa, but I haven't decided whether I want to vote for this government or not in the parliament election. I probably won't. Mm. Uh, so we have that option. We can course correct. Mm. We can clean the place up. We can throw out the rascals. Why should mind the Rajapaksa, who's been in office for less than 10 years, mm. suffer for the sins of a party that has been in office for 20 years? That's correct. Most of it under Chandrika, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Her sins... Mm are being added on to the sins of commission and omission of this government as well. And we've also forgotten that we've had 30 years of war. Many of these problems accumulated during 30 years of war. They're now visible because we are not being blown up in the streets anymore. So we can afford to talk about this other stuff. It needs to be addressed, but we can fix it at the parliamentary election because it's like saying you have a tummy ache and, and somebody recommends that you do brain surgery. Uh, I'm a political scientist. I know that this is a problem that can be solved by changing the balance of forces. This is to do with regime behavior. Mm. Let's change regime behavior by altering the balance and having a strong opposition or maybe even uh, an, another a government with a new prime minister. And it could be Mr. Sivisena. But it would be very stupid to do one of two things and it would be suicidal to do both, mm. which is to throw out a successful leader by any international standard and to smash up the constitutional political order within a hundred days, transferring power to a parliament which has shown on national television that it's playing a game of musical chairs every day. So that's a recipe for suicide as a nation, Shanaka. I'm opposed to the abolition of the executive presidency, which will happen if, if we vote against Mahindra Rajapaksa and vote for uh, Maitri, who's a nice man, but who should be the PM or the leader of the opposition. And maybe someday, President, maybe next time, but not this time. It's a wrong, wrong decision to make. It's a very bad decision if we go that way. So I will, uh, I, I would clearly advocate the re-election of President Rajapaksa and the retention of the executive presidency uh, and a more gradualistic view of constitutional reform because MC3 talks about converting the parliament into a constituent assembly 
uh, and uh, producing a new balanced constitution in a year. Now, that seems to be the right way to go because we did that in 72. Yeah. We did it again in 78. Right. So, that's the right way to go. It's low risk. This other thing that the opposition is saying, throw out Mahindra Rajapaksa, send him home, uh, put your cursor to Maitri and click on it, and then there's a drop down box and it's Ranil and Chandrika <laughs> in it. Uh, you it's know, nice retro, back to the 90s. Yes. Um, that's yeah. far too risky. Let's not go there. Let's not do that. Yeah. But let's balance this by re electing Mahinda and perhaps electing a new government at the parliamentary election. Right. Now, in every election uh, of small countries like us, as you know, international powers has their play. I would call it power play. They are trying, you know, it's a cricketing term now. What do you see? The I would, I would be daring enough to say the West or some other countries or international countries. What is their role and their play in this election? Well, you know... What do they really want? I, 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 don't, re I don't like to go with, uh, with what the government says. Yes. I'm, I'm not a government uh, person. I'm not a party man. I like to be uh, independent in my views. Mm. Uh, I must say, though, that what's happening here... Mm is exactly the same template, the same program, the same ball game, the same playbook that I have seen in operation uh, in the Ukraine, in the so-called color revolutions, which first got rid of uh, Milosevic after he lost the war in 1990 in the Serbian elections. Uh, in Ukraine, even a victorious president was pushed out. I mean, the way this opposition is geared up, if President Rajapaksa wins only narrowly, they'll hit the streets and make this place ungovernable. So therefore, actually, he needs a big majority. Mm. And I hope he gets one. Um, this is what they did in, uh, which they are doing in Venezuela. Mm. This same opposition of far right and far left. What do they want to achieve? Well, they don't want strong, independent-minded leaders. Mm. They don't want a strong state which can uh, deal with Western hegemonism on its well, if not on its own terms, at least it can resist. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the opposition manifesto, I'm not saying it's drawn up by the West, yeah. but if it is implemented, you have a very weak state. Your executive presidency, the, the fortress is dismantled. Dismantle. Yes. You have a multipolar situation, yes. and the West can yes. and will yes. uh, move in and government. strengthen the Northern Provincial Council. Mm -hmm. They won't call it Elam. Mm -hmm. It'll be rather like the ISGA of the Tigers. Mm -hmm or the P. Toms of Chandrika, they'll strengthen it in the way that they have strengthened uh, Kurdistan. Yeah. I mean, it's a virtual separate state, uh. Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh. I mean, look what happened to Kosovo. It was initially a UN protectorate, and then it moved through a referendum towards an independent state. Uh. Look at South Sudan. Uh. They're going to be back in the north, and they're going to be back in the north for two reasons. One, because of the electoral clout of the Tamil diaspora, and two, more importantly, because Trincomalee is located there. And this is a big game against China. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think I would like us to balance between the US, India, and China. But I am proud that there is an Asian power which, which doesn't have a Tamil diaspora, uh, which is now a world power and is on our side, and that's China. Right. So you are saying, uh, if I get what you're saying correct, that there is an interest from the Western powers. And oh, yes. Is it uh, because of the uh, our country's uh, ge geographical positioning, or is it because they simply doesn't want a president, uh, a, a leader who's strong like the president, or is it uh, all of this? Four, or is it something four, else? four reasons. Four reasons. China. I had a conversation with the uh, uh, deputy foreign minister of Cuba mm. uh, on the sidelines of a high-level segment of the UNESCO in mm. Paris, and while puffing on his cigar. Mm. Uh, he asked Cuban me, Sikai, yeah, yes. Mr. Ambassador, yeah. uh, why do you, he said in, in New York we supported you uh, and we saw that this move against Sri Lanka was unprecedented. It's a test case because you have won a war, uh, but they're still trying to push you back. And uh, why, why do you think, he asked me. Mm. So I gave three reasons. I said, well, there's the Tamil diaspora lobby and the electoral significance of that lobby. Two, the West has a certain notion of uh, uh, human rights and the responsibility to protect. They want to be the ones who decide which wars are fought to a victorious finish and which are not. And we violated that. Uh, they want to uh, uh, impose their international legal norms on us. Uh, and the third one is the strategic competition with China. Uh, they see that Sri Lanka is uh, 
closer to or under the umbrella of the Chinese and therefore they want to change the regime and, and put in place a puppet regime and those are the reasons that I understand. He said, uh, Ambassador, you've probably forgotten the most important reason. All that's true. And he said, I've met your president a few times. In fact, before when he was prime minister, I was there in the 90s and so on. Mm -hmm. Says this um, deputy foreign minister of Cuba. I've met him in New York, he says. And he says, you know, your president, Rajapaksa, he is far too independent-minded for these Western powers. Mm. He's a, he's a real nationalist. He's a patriot. He's too independent for them. That is probably the main reason. They want to make an example of it. Uh, too independent. He won the war when, you know, when they tried to stop it. And he seemed to be friendly with China. They want to make an example of him. That is probably the reason he's far too independent for them. Now, that immediately triggered certain memories in me because I was in the room. I was part of the discussion. When President Rajapaksa eyeballed it with U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Richard Boucher mm. uh, and uh, said, and of course this conversation was, was entirely in English, mm. President Rajapaksa, uh, he countered some of the things the Americans said and he pointed out uh, the air strikes that had taken place, the drone strikes and so on, that very day in the newspapers, the killing of civilians. And then he said, Mr. Boucher, is it my fault that our terrorists are not Islamic. <laughs> now, you know, it takes guts to do that. Do that, yes. And I heard from the French foreign minister in 2009, I heard it in 2012 in Paris at lunch, from Bernard Kushner, mm. who was the French foreign minister who came along with Foreign Secretary David Miliband of Britain uh, to try to stop the war. And, you know... Uh, are these the very people who were involved in Kosovo and all that? Uh, of yes. course they were. Uh, Bernard Kushner, Bernard Kushner was the yes. UN Special Commissioner who facilitated the independence of Kosovo. Kosovo yeah. And he told us, he told my wife Sanja and myself, and we had one of the staff also there, he said that uh, he and his staff had designed a t-shirt, they used to wear the t-shirt, with the which said Kosovo, we did it in the dark. Mm. So, you know, under UN resolutions, contrary to UN resolutions, mm. they facilitated independence. But Kushner told me, that he sort of was on the side of President Rajapaksa during the conversation with David Miliband. Uh, he said, because David Miliband tried to threaten mm. President Rajapaksa, there will be consequences, you know, I've come back from the United States and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, he said, President Rajapaksa, your president, told David, Mr. Miliband, we are no longer a British colony. Mm. Now, you know, there's so many pygmies who are trying to take credit for, mm. for, for all of that, you know, Champika Ranavaka and this one and that one and Chandrika who won 75% of the war and so on. Yeah. I mean, there was nobody else there. I mean, Bernard Kushner told me the story and I later checked with uh, President Rajapaksa, but I did hear it from him. I heard it from Kushner. Mm. I mean, here is a man who stood up for Sri Lanka, for our nation, uh, and eyeballed it. I don't see Mr. Sirisena or Rani Lord Chandrika doing that. So that's uh, why I think the West wants to get rid of him and put in place a puppet administration and a weaker state structure, dismantling the executive presidency. So then they can deal separately with the provinces uh, and, with, uh, and manipulate each personality and power center. In any case, we know that Rani Lord Chandrika are sort of very pro-Western. It's not accidental that on the opposition platforms you have attacks on China. Mm. I mean, what is China's fault? Supporting us for 30 years of the war when the West didn't support us. <laughs> for being a great Asian economic superpower uh, whom we can tap to build our infrastructure. Is that why we are, the opposition is attacking China? So, for all these reasons, I'm pretty sure uh, that Western hegemonism wants uh, regime change, change, wants a dismantled state and will not stop because they want to make an example of President Rajapaksa for being defiant and proceeding to finish the war, they will request the new government if President Rajapaksa loses. They will say, we want him to face some questions. Mm. And do you think that Ranil or Chandrika or Ranil and Chandrika will not comply? They Mr. Poor Mr. Maithi Palace won't know what has happened. It happened in Serbia. Mm. The president, the new president didn't know. The prime minister approved of uh, Milosevic being taken. Mm. 
Mr. Sirisena will not know until he wakes up the next morning to have his family at breakfast that Ranil and Chandrika have approved of this and it has already been implemented. Do we want that on our conscience? I don't. I don't think any citizen in Sri Lanka would ever want that. You brought in China. China fact is a very big thing spoken in, in many, many, many stages. Like you said, they helped us a lot. Now my question is, is China fact uh, uh, a, a wrong thing? And what is our foreign policy under this government? Is it wrong? Is it, it, does it need, uh, like you said, course change? Or, or what is your opinion? Well, Chanaka, I have been a very sharp critic of uh, the present foreign policy of, uh, and the implementation of the foreign policy, the management of the foreign policy by uh, the present administration. But that has never extended to a criticism of President Rajapaksa's leadership. Because I much prefer President Rajapaksa, who stands for our national sovereignty, uh, to anyone who can't even mention the term non-alignment in the election manifesto. I mean, that's a disgrace. It can't be an accident. I, I don't want to see this country run by Western puppets. I remember this place in the 1990s under Chandrika's presidency and Ranil Wickremesinghe's prime ministership. You couldn't recognize it. This place was being dominated by uh, the international NGOs, uh, people who came for tsunami assistance, uh, peace NGOs, Western embassies, yes. and their local hangers on. Yes. The place, the country didn't belong to us yes. under Ranil and Chandrika. I prefer a country that belongs to us. Right. What do you think, we are in the last days of close support election, would happen in these last days? Well, the people have to make a historic choice. If we make the wrong choice, it's not like any other presidential election. We will roll downhill. The Russians made that mistake. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev was very sincere, just like Mr. Sarisena, but he went too far, too fast in his reforms. They were hijacked by Mr. Boris Yeltsin, who was a president. I mean, he was elected. Uh, and the Soviet Union was dismantled. And then the people of Russia suddenly woke up and found out that they were, their power, their status in the world had gone, that they were being kicked around, that the great superpower they belonged to didn't exist anymore. And after 10 years of retreat, they found Mr. Putin and made him the president. Now, we won't be able to do that because these people would have abolished the presidency. They're, you can't even, even if you find a Putin, you can't make him the president and restore the situation. We would have just given away the store. We would be second class citizens in our own country. And the game plan is very clear. Mr. Mangala Samarvira wrote it in the Sunday Times many months ago. He said, we don't, we don't need the Sinhalese vote. We base ourselves on the Tamil and Muslim vote, that's 30 percent, and then you need only a, a small fraction of the singular vote, and we can get that with the UNP and uh, uh, dissidents from the SLFP. So I am opposed to majority hegemonism over the minorities, Chanaka, but I am also opposed to a minoritarian hegemony over the majority, which is what we had when Chandrika was president and Ranil was PM. I don't want us to go back to that again. So I am hoping and I am calling for us not to be fooled. I'm saying we can have the cake and eat it. We can continue to have a strong and successful leader and continue this modernization while making the changes we want to make at the parliamentary election, which we can do now because we have a, a popular personality, unlike Mr. Vikram Singh. We have Mr. Maithi Palasarisena, who is electable. So there's no longer fear that if President Rajapaksa wins the presidential election, oh, you can't have any change because nobody's going to vote the other way at the uh, parliamentary election. They will. They didn't because Ranil was leading the opposition. Now there's a new personality. We can have Mr. Sirisena come in, in parliament, and push the government in the right direction. We can even have a new government. But we should not change the executive presidency. Uh, we should not destroy it. And we should not change at this stage. President Rajapaksa, who has been so successful uh, in overcoming terrorism, which many countries have failed to do, if you look around the world, and in rebuilding Sri Lanka after 30 years of war, 
in such a manner that he's actually building a new look Sri Lanka. We spoke a lot, you said, in so many different, diverse, various, in different subjects. We, as normal people of the country, what should be our duty? Vote in very large numbers to save Sri Lanka and the status of this nation by continuing to have the strong and successful leadership of President Rajapaksa, while reserving the right to vote for uh, the opposition at the parliamentary election. Dr. Dan Jajlebe, thank you very much for joining us on Cross Current today.